Hello and welcome to today's flow session with the Valley Stream Management Consortium. I'm Helen Beale. I'm the CEO here. And today we're going to be talking about cracking the enterprise adoption challenge. And I am joined by Logan Dable from one of our leading members, uh, Entity Data or Launch by Entity Data, where Logan is Director of Consulting. But I'm sure there's lots more he'd like to share about himself. Uh, Logan, tell us all about what you're up to. Thanks, Helen. Thanks for having me, and thanks for inviting um, Launch by NTT Data to host with you. Yeah, uh, Director of Consulting here, been working on trying to build out uh, practices that support value stream management, which is why we're a leader member here at the Value Stream Management Consortium, and also just trying to build out uh, better business agility practices. So, you know, uh, cracking the nut, Cracking the enterprise nut and being successful with these sorts of practices is very important to us, and I'm glad to get to talk to you about it today. Fabulous. Welcome. Um, and we can take questions at any time, so pop them in the chat. Let's start talking about enterprises and what they are and where they are at today. So I've been in this uh, world of technology for nearly three decades, showing my age a little bit, but I'm thinking the enterprise landscape has changed a little bit over those years. We've had like some companies have been around that whole time, like some enterprises that I've worked with, like Lloyd's Banking Group, are over 250 years old and they're massive. They're like tens of thousands of people. Um, I think there's probably some enterprises we work with that are probably in the hundreds of thousands of people, like the NHS in the UK is absolutely massive in that kind of like that mm. scale. Um, in your experience, how do you define an enterprise and where's, where's kind of the start? Where's the stop? How have they changed in recent times and what are the real challenges we're trying to deal with? Yeah, great question. Um, my my thoughts on the enterprise are going to be customers that are probably in Fortune 500, maybe even in Fortune 1000. Those are typically the ones that we get to work with at NDT Data. Um, not to say that uh, enterprise might not be defined as something that might be smaller than that in revenue, but those are the, the big ones. Um, a lot of the companies also, from an enterprise perspective, that that, that we like to work with are still working on making their digital transformation dreams come true. Um, as you know, a lot of a forcing function came to us within the pandemic. Um, and I think that we've kind of been beneficiaries of that from a large big picture consulting perspective, not just at NTT data. Um, and, and now with these enterprises that we're trying to work with, um, we're finding that still is true, surprisingly, maybe, uh, maybe not. Um, but that's, yeah, enterprises, big, very big. Big, companies. and as you said, we can measure them by revenue as well. And I think it's kind of an interesting thing to talk about that. Um, you mentioned, that I think, Fortune 500, we have the FTSE 100, we have the Standard Paul Star Jones, all these different kind of like ways of stacking or rating the, the highest performing organisations. And that um, that mix has changed a lot in recent years. And I think a lot of companies mm. that sat in those charts for a long time have been pushed out by some of the digital disruptors. So um, that message that people need to get better at being digital in this digital economy has landed. We see it in the data. Um, that if people want to keep having those levels of performance, they, they have to get this stuff. So what I often say when I've been working um, with change in large organizations and we're talking about value stream management today but in some respects there's little difference from value stream management to devops to agile to e-business to trying to put one of these improvement frameworks in an organization there's no doubt it's challenging what i often say about the reason that it's challenging is because what we're often trying to do is help people learn a different way of doing things and that's sometimes hundreds of people, sometimes thousands, tens of thousands, and so we just said hundreds of thousands of people that have got to kind of think about a new way of doing things, have the time to realise what they're doing now and the time to try and figure out the new way and implement the new way of doing things. Leadership plays a really important role in this because they have to give people permission, if you like, to find that time and make that time away from just processing the daily work of keeping a business going. Um, what's leadership's role in enterprise adoption of value stream management, do you think? I think it's multifold. We find uh, some different approaches to get leadership involved. Um, maybe, maybe most importantly is uh, getting their buy-in because leadership tries to drive a lot of decision-making most often. 
Um, but, but sometimes what we see is that that decision making isn't very data centric. And so a lot of the work that we get to do from a value stream management perspective is to bring more data centric opportunities for decision making to the leadership team. Um, these, these leaders in enterprises also, especially if they're publicly traded, have a lot of other um, things that they have to, to be honest to finance, financially, big bets on, you know, big bets from shareholders. And um, sometimes those decisions can cause uh, some challenges in trying to get those leaders to also be data centric on what's important to the enterprise. And so I can, there's a distinction, right? We've got financials, we've got shareholder obligations, um, and then we've got these big business value obligations that we, we want to try to focus these leaders on to start making and getting them to add that dimension to their decision-making framework is where I think a lot of our opportunities in value stream management still lie. And so, um, you know, bringing that to bringing, bringing the data centric decision-making and being able to connect important value stream metrics to their metrics that they're already keeping track of to make be those better decisions is, is going to be important. Otherwise, I think leadership tends to, at least from a doer's perspective and a middle management perspective, it, it, it seems that in the feedback that we get from a consulting perspective is that leaders can get in the way of big change initiatives that are important. I think it's one of the things that really resonated with me there was what you talked about in terms of the metrics and the, the governance elements of leadership. And I, I wanted to refer to an email that I received overnight from one of our members um, who works for a large uh, global manufacturer. And we were talking about some of the challenges they're having in their enterprise adoption. And they were talking about an experiment that they tried that related to having strategic value stream success metrics. Um, and it was really challenging and they've taken a lot of lessons from it. Um, the owners that they had doing this kind of experiment were measured on other metrics. So things like the scope and the schedule of capabilities um, in their requirements management system by senior leadership. But using, they were trying to get to a place where they could use outcome metrics that could use to measure and show bottlenecks and improve the design and flow of work for funny students. And because that wasn't part of their job description and not a metric looked at by leadership, it was not received, not executed. They're also practicing safe and um, rather mm -hmm. than supporting PI planning and PI execution, those value stream leaders were constantly pulled into traditional like waterfally type monthly operating review metrics, cost estimate, completion budget. So very project oriented. Um, so I wondered what you see in your customers like that when we talk about getting to these right metrics, moving from project to product, getting to flow metrics rather than project oriented delivery metrics. Where where do you see the problems and solutions there? There's still a lot of opportunities to improve uh, improve the, the challenges that you're describing. We see that a lot. We still see a lot of falling back on project based measurement. Uh, I think that that's relatively, it's relatively important to understand why, at least in my opinion and from my perspective, I see that. I see a lot of, pro, you know, falling back on project management and project metrics because a lot of finance organizations don't know how to really understand and adopt and apply the project to uh, project to product sort of uh, mindset and thereby, right, like value stream management, value stream metrics, because we don't often have a framework for the finance organization to work in so that they can make more incremental investments and also try to measure those incremental investments. And so that that's, um, I feel like if I can figure that out at some point in my career, <laughs> or you know, work with a group of great people that are on this phone call uh, listening to try to figure that one out, we can make some pretty big successful jumps across the board in the enterprise. We have some good examples, right? You know, you have the unicorns that have probably figured out how to do this. Um, you have large tech-based firms that have figured out how to do this, but companies like we started out with that are trying to make those digital transformations that are brick and mortar, um, struggle. And so that's where I say there's the opportunity to really jump in and, and get better 
uh, at, at the value stream measurement. It just takes a lot of education up front and it takes some people who probably aren't so willing to run these sorts of incremental experiments to actually, you know, um, go along on the journey with us. So when you do that kind of adoption engagement, um, you walk into it knowing there's an, there's a large education piece of work that you need to do. Um, how does this look like from an, in, a, an education perspective? So you've you've met your client, you've got, I'm assuming you've got a key sponsor who's going to, who's your primary point of engagement. Um, they found some budget somewhere um, and they're going to start working with you. What's the first thing that you do? First thing that we do is line up on just a handful of outcomes, or at least try to describe what outcomes we want to get out of our engagement with them together, or you know, flip that vice versa, what they want to get out of our engagement with them. And we need to know what's the most important one. Um, you know, I, I just finished reading Steve's book, um, Value Flow Engineering, excuse me. And um, you know, the first, I think that they get it right. The approach on starting with outcome mapping is an approach that we take. We have to have a good guiding place to go and ground our decisions in. Um, that typically leads us to ask ourselves, okay, we have this outcome that we want to drive. Who isn't in the room that can help us influence that outcome? And going back to my previous answer, we generally have to go find the right people still uh, from around the CEO's table or a proxy person from the from the CEO's table that typically represents the finance organization to start to help unwind how we can get to uh, success in that outcome because it is going to take some help from the finance organization. So you start with an outcome mapping session. I'm just putting some links in the chat, by the way, so people can get to the book if they haven't already come across it or get to. We've done a couple of flow sessions with uh, Steve recently since the launch of the book back in, in May. Um, you start with an outcome mapping session. Um, do you do that in person? Do you do it virtually or does it depend on the client? How many people do you get in the room? Do you yeah. normally get someone from the finance team or as you said, if it's that proxy, what who could be a finance proxy? Yeah, um, we have been able to get back in person for these sorts of events. So we typically try to run them in person um, we try to make it an offsite with a client. So we get them out of their normal routine and ask for no distractions. Please turn off phones and notifications and computers for at least a couple hours. Um, you know, it's generally a leader from IT, a leader from operations, a leader from the business. There's all sorts of titles that you might see for business sorts of folks. And then from a finance perspective, uh, generally what we see is a finance person that's kind of mapped onto a specific business unit in an organization. So the proxy can be that um, representative from finance for that business unit. And that way, you know, again, I think a, one of the bigger challenges we find once we've had the outcome mapping and we, we go back to asking ourselves if we have the right people in the room is that we, um, we still need a finance person um, and we still have to help get that person in the room to help align on outcomes that, I'm sorry, allow, allow, align on the activities to get that outcome to a better place. And at this point, this group of people that you've got in the room, are they all associated with a value stream? Do they think they're all associated with a specific value stream or do you think they're a specific value stream or how have you decided on this specific group of people? I think um, we, tr we try our best to get them to think about uh, bringing a value stream together. Oftentimes what we find out when we're done with this initial work workshop is that their understanding of what a value stream is, is wildly different than what many of us would see that as from the value stream management consortium and, you know, other bodies that kind of believe in forming value streams and building it, building the organization around them. Uh, so I'd say in most cases, more than half, we have, to do some more work to help the organization also understand the value stream. Um, and it may even, you know, come back to previous answer. Do we have the right people in the room to actually make decisions about that value stream and the outcomes associated with it? 
So a common challenge that we have across all of these ways of working when we're trying to adopt them into organisation is what we call relabeling, which I'm sure you're very familiar with as well. But this idea that we might be adopting Agile and we'll just rename our business analyst product owners, for example, without really understanding what that, that role is and how it's different and educating people. Um, what you just said then about sometimes you start working with these organizations and their idea of what a value stream looks quite different from what our understanding of value stream might be. I've experienced firsthand um, myself uh, recently and actually several years, quite a long time ago with one of the very large global banks that I work with, where they did, it was a case of relabeling, where they decided they were going to do value stream management and they basically just renamed business units. So you suddenly had the mortgages value stream and the retail banking value stream, but they, they weren't really value streams. They were collections of value streams and the work mm -hmm. wasn't really done to drill down and understand what those value streams really are. Now, for me, a value stream is anything that, delivers a product or a service to a customer and it starts with an idea and finishes when that value is experienced by the customer. But that's my view on it and my experiences. When you see these organizations and their view of what a value stream is is different from yours, what do they tend to think a value stream is? And is it is there a common, we'll call it a misperception, we'll say that we're right. <laughs> What's is there a common <laughs> misperception of what a value stream is in those instances? And if so, what is that? And how do we address it? Yeah, um, strangely enough, um, this is a great question to to pick through with you. The, the I don't know what's causing the misconception, um, but what I've seen over a few client engagements over the past 18 months is that the value streams are actually just relabeling products. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen it, in all of them, and there's been three engagements that have been in over these last 18 months. And um, it is, uh, it's a surprise to me every time. And so I don't know where the misconception is is coming from. Um, again, I, I would say, you know, digging in and trying to understand it is just a misunderstanding of what a value stream actually is. And what I see clients trying to call a value stream is, um, kind of an inward focus of what value means. So does something that we work on, like a technology capability or a platform, bring value to us? Uh, oftentimes it's also us as just in technology as opposed to us as the larger organization. And so uh, I think some of that is just because people are grabbing onto a term that's very popular right now and trying to use it to... Um, help institute change in the organization. Uh, and so trying to unwind it there is also trying to get folks to understand um, the definition very close to what, what you just said, uh, taking an idea from concept to cash or concept to value realization or miss mission accomplished. Uh, it, it's a whole new way of thinking, um, especially for organizations who've siloed themselves into us versus them, business versus IT, all of that still exists, as I'm sure you can attest to in some of, of, of the work that you do. Uh, and so we still have to try to unwind that and get them to think that the value stream is, is the big thing. It's not part of a portfolio. It's not part of a project. It, it should guide all of the decisions that we make to form those things that we need to organize a value stream with. Absolutely. I've commonly seen people um, classify value streams in two different types, business and delivery. Um, so product and software engineering, whereas what we've really got is the front end of the value stream where we're getting the idea and working through that. And then the people on the back end of the value stream that are building it and delivering it. So that's quite, I find it quite painful um, after all the decades that people are making that separation still, because it's been something that we've been talking about for such a long time. And, you know, it started with, um, IT int IT aligns with the business, then IT integrates with the business, then IT is the business, but we still haven't got there in many, many enterprises. So let's just recap. Um, we've had a change agent have a vision. Um, they've decided to start, they've found some budget, they've engaged with you. 
We've done some outcome mapping. We've got a handful of outcomes. We've got some clues about how finance are going to support us to achieve those outcomes. And we're doing some re-education um, and expectation setting about what a value stream is. What happens next? Uh, then the next part is probably even more challenging to, than um, getting the, the finance folks to align and be part of the solution. Um, the, the next part is, is all about organizational change management, um, finding the right teams that need to support the value stream and the products and services that you actually want to deliver in those value streams becomes, um, probably the thing that just takes us the most time to help the organization understand how to actually promote the outcome that they want to get to. Um, oftentimes what you find in these organizations, especially right, like, you know, speaking from my experience over these last 18 months, when these organizations have relabeled a project, a value stream, what we often find is that the people that are supporting the projects now named the value stream are spread across multiple different capabilities. They're matrixed. They have multiple projects that they're working on. Now they have multiple value streams that they're working on. And we have to then help with the education on, no, we need these teams to come together and actually support one service or one capability or one product inside of a value stream and let them continually work on that, where you can insulate the team from dependencies, not from each other. And that becomes a large task because the organizations not only have to understand how their people are working together, um, they actually have to go and understand how their architecture, technology and business architectures are built and how they're supposed to support them. Um, again, three out of three of the last ones, we find that we need to make these team changes, but also understand and potentially make some, some very large business and architecture changes because um, the teams need to form around the architecture, not the, not the opposite way around. And oftentimes we have to make some large architecture changes, or at least propose um, those large architecture changes and start to make some headway there to help. So two things here to drill down in. One is organizational and one is architectural. So I wanna start with the organizational piece. This is really, really complicated. There's all these different ways of working and organizations are inherently, inherently complex as well. You just talked about this idea that we've got project managers that are being relayed with value stream owners or value stream managers that are actually effectively matrixed across multiple value streams because they're calling projects value streams. We've got this complexity that there is this great transition that we are moving from waterfall to product, um, waterfall to agile, project to product. In my experience, almost every value stream mapping exercise I've done in the last decade has been on a project. And sometimes the people have been very self-aware coming into it that that project is becoming a product. So the very first value stream I mapped was with a company called Vocalink. It was just after the big economic crash. Um, globally, banks were being instructed to separate their retail and investment arms. Um, and the project that Vocalink had just completed was separating BAC's payment for HSBC. And they knew that they were going to have to do it for all of their banking customers. So they recognized that they were going to repeat this project, which made it a product because it was something that they were then going to package up, sell and enhance. So they were very avert about it. I had other maps I did were like when GDPR came out, there's a very large charity in the UK, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, the RSPB. Um, and they brought together a brand new team and we value stream mapped up front what they were going to create. So the creation of their, it looked like a project, but they were actually creating a product that would serve RSPB to be able to enhance um, all of their systems as, as additional governance and compliance changes were made. So I think where I'm trying to get to with this is like when it's so complex, where do we start? And this is a big conversation we all had in the consulting huddle last year when we were putting together the um, implementation workshop for the implementation roadmap for identification. Um, 
there is value at starting a value a single value stream so trying to identify one or two value streams to pilot with and experiment some of the value stream practices like mapping like continuous inspection and adaptation like accessing the data that will help the leaders but there's also value at the leadership level um, and the organizational whole so understanding the organization as a whole value stream network so let me try and bring this back to two questions one how do you communicate with an organization that the team level of value stream management practices is important from empowering them for daily improvement and that the leadership level is important for being able to understand their entire portfolio of risk and reward and opportunity. Um, and the next one is, have you seen any organizations yet that truly understand their whole organization as a value stream network that have mapped the whole thing? If not, do you think we're gonna see that or you're going to see that in the next year or two. So one's about leadership use case versus team use case. And the one, other question is about um, the entirety of the organizational whole as a VSN or a value stream network. I'll answer the second one first. Okay. Uh, that's easier for me. Um, I still think we're many years away from organi an organization. Again, and thinking, talk, thinking about who we typically work with. Uh, They've existed for decades, if not, you know, hit the hundred year plus mark. Um, there's some rethinking, read mindset, not read mindset, but mindset adjustments that have to come into play before they can start to define and map those networks into a value stream network. And I think um, while we may start working with those clients today, I still think we're way past, you know, it'll take us more than a year or two to get there. Um, I feel like most of that is really probably because generally there's so few of us that are thinking in the, in, in this way, in this, this, you know, think about how customer, a value flows to customers or value flows to your business or both. Um, and, and that as the world gets more educated on what that means and how it works, that, that we may may be able to speed up adoption. Um, so, so I haven't seen it yet to finish the answer to that question, and I still think that we're more than a couple of years away from from seeing that. Um, first question: <clears throat> I I think that the answer in my in my opinion, it is that the, the, the alignment has to be intertwined between leadership and teams for them to find success in a, you know, a, the operating model or the methodology of value stream management. Um, what I, what I see kind of a, a symptom of that not happening today is that too few teams try to focus on improvement work. They are very focused on feature work or becoming a feature factory. Maybe they don't really know that. Um, let's just say that, you know, we've kind of taken step by step of how we want to get enterprise adoption to happen. We've defined a value stream, we've got the right outcomes. We've aligned the right people and decision makers. We've got the teams aligned to the value stream in the right way that we think is going to be successful. There's a focus on driving as much value as possible to customer end user and not enough focus on making sure that we're identifying the risks and impediments and technical debt and architecture debt and whatever debt we might incur um, and making sure that we're trying to make decisions to keep that low or as low as possible for whatever risk profile we, we want to carry throughout the life of a product or a service. And um, I guess, you know, coming to the close of the answer is, and the reason I say that the adoption or use of value stream management by both leadership and teams is, is intertwined is because we need for both of those groups of people to be focused on um, the path to remove impediments in order to get better for their clients. 
and stop focusing on how many features we want to release, but focus on the actual value and doing the things that are most valuable and prioritizing in a way that makes sure that we can focus and provide clarity for ourselves. I definitely want to circle back around to the architecture, but I still think there's a little further I want to go um, with this, which is what you were just talking about, prioritization and most valuable work. And we've we've established that we don't think, and I've asked the same question of Karen Martin and quite a few other people, we don't think we've seen an organization that has mapped their entire value stream network or has made their entire value stream network visible as yet. However, we do know that there are portfolio management tools out there and it's like, if we, we agree that a project isn't a value stream, but a project often is an indicator of where a value stream may be coming to life as a product and a product often is a value stream. In portfolio management, if we've got a very product centric organization, do, does their portfolio management system represent their value stream network in some way in your experience? I think it, I do think it does. I think it um, partially represents the value stream network. Um, it certainly would be, I think it would be fair to say that it would represent um, customer and business need requirements, whatever we want to call it. And uh, I, I think the other part of that is, you know, these, these tools that you're talking about allow us to see um, textual representations of what we want to do and what our clients want or what, what our customers want. Then there's all of the tools and people that support the portfolio management tools uh, where you're going to get more information about the kind of the technical support and the proxies of how successful, how fast we're moving and vice versa uh, that, that also support being able to bring the value stream network or illuminate it and being able to see it. We don't have a question yet. We have some comments which are kind of in agreement with us. And Greg's actually said in his last company, maybe about 8% prior 10%, previous, previous 50%, a toy company in terms of the percentage of their organization that they could see um, mm -hmm. in the Valley Stream network. Um, I want to get onto the architecture because partly because Stephen Waters has chipped in there as well um, and he hasn't actually mentioned architecture but I think this is important organizationally what I often say to people is the value streams exist whether you have seen them or called them value streams kind of doesn't matter they're there if you're if you're in business you're supplying customers or citizens if you're in government um, which means you'll have a process for getting stuff to them. And that is essentially a value stream. What value stream management is about is uncovering those value streams in order to be able to do something meaningful with them. And as you've described, either make stuff go faster to the customer and or preferably and um, make sure that the stuff we are delivering is the best stuff that we could um, be delivering to them. We work in tech though, and this is partly why value stream management has become so important, why the consortium exists, is because we've gone through, um, in as we've moved towards this digital economy, and we've gone through a lot of digital transformation already, we've done things like DevOps, and we've delivered DevOps tool chains, which have digitized value streams and made them potentially um, visible to us. There is another side to that pipeline, though, which is what our overall architecture looks like. And this is what Stephen Waters and his, his friend Craig Statham explore in the Valley Stream reference architecture, which is available through the VSMC's website. I'll pop a link in the chat in a minute. And there's a whole community that we set up. You can join there as well. But how much of a barrier in the enterprise adoption process is having, for example, a very legacy siloed architecture? I think that kind of this, and this is a broader answer than just who we work with. This is based on my own reading yeah. and research. Um, again, I think uh, firms or companies that have been born out of the digital age and the age of software um, probably don't struggle with siloed off architectures. There's a um, number of examples uh, out, out on the internet where you can kind of, I think, glean that that's the case. 
it's interesting too that that you find that some of those examples um, I can pull on what I remember from the DevOps handbook here and the the case studies that we get from there to kind of ground us and you know if 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 it's been a while since you've read it maybe go back and read but those case studies are really neat that you see how some organizations in the technology industry start and then they recognize that they've created an architecture that's not going to be able to move forward with them into the future and they figure out how they're going to restart or refactor or both uh, to make themselves successful um i still think that the companies that were not born out of the current software age they were born before struggle to even ask themselves um or have that conversation uh, and for a number of reasons, um, it just works is often what, what we end up hearing. I don't want to change something if it's not broken. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of organizations that are really large from before the software age can just buy a solution to help them navigate a problem uh, or merge or acquire companies. So uh, to answer that question, I think there's a delineation of, of companies that are kind of formed around the 2000s era and anybody that's from before that still struggles with soloing off their architectures and still has a lot of work to do to try to figure out how to make sure that they're not disrupted because of um, where they came from. Yeah. So Mike has his hand up. So I'm just going to unmute. Mike, uh, Mike, do you have a question for us? You might need to unmute yourself. I've I've done talking permitted. I think you need to unmute yourself as well if you'd like to say something. Hi. No, that wasn't him. That was Logan. Just pop something in the chat if you like, Mike. Um, in the chat, Jim has po popped in a reference to beyond budgeting as well. So I wondered if you had any firsthand experience in using some of the principles in there um, in terms of continuous funding and, you know, doing road rolling quarterly and moving from our annual traditional annual budgeting, whether that was a tool that you'd used with your finance people. It's definitely part of the conversation. Yep. Yeah. Mike, Mike's now got his hand down. Um, yeah, Just I think maybe, but maybe, yeah. We um we do have that conversation. Um, still a lot of of hesitation um with those because it, 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 beyond budgeting, I guess it doesn't for the clients that we work with, and even some other you know the reading outside of my organization that I do some. Organizations are hesitant because they they haven't seen enough of a positive outcome from beyond budgeting, or it doesn't apply to my industry. There's just opportunities there to uh, to help them get to uh, a better place there as well. Cool. So we do have a couple of questions in the question in the Q and A area. One is from Stephen. Um, how do you help the senior leadership to understand the importance if, of the basis of value stream management? if you're competing against other agendas that appear to shout louder about the dollars, like AI, for example, we were having a chat about AI crowd <laughs> out earlier on. So yeah, how do we help them prioritize BSM? Um, I don't have an answer for AI like we were talking about earlier. I think that, you know, you had mentioned it's um, just part of the hype cycle and it's kind of hard to get over, but for other um, shouting that is happening that is not part of AI. The basis or the importance of understanding value streams and value stream management and kind of getting past people who might think it's too expensive or people that think that it's a waste of um, time and money is really to kind of try to call out whether or not, you know, if it's true or not, um, are you actually making data centric decisions in way too many organizations that I've worked with over my career, we are not making, I say we, uh, it's, a, it's an issue I think that I would self-admit. We do not, we do not do enough to try to make sure that our decisions are data centric. And I think that trying to maybe not 
call it out in a negative way, but kind of illuminate the fact that you don't have all the data you need and that this idea of value stream management for the organization can help you bring a better decision-making framework to your organization is, um, is, is a way to try to promote it. And it can support those folks that are kind of shouting about the dollars and want to, you know, don't want to use it on this thing called value stream management, but it could promoting it as something that could help them. Um, maybe an easy answer, but it's, uh, it's the best one that I can think of. It's the one that seems to have some steam behind it for us and, and trying to work through. Um, I think that the, the other side of that answer is, you also have to give people time to adjust to having a different decision-making framework. That's not just, um, financially based. If it's decision, if it's a data centric decision-making framework, some of the data that you're getting may be relatively difficult to understand or difficult to admit to. And, uh, you've got to find a way to find some common ground to, change an outcome that would help you. Going back a bit with um, with another question as well, um, this concept of, and this is, this is relevant to the data conversation, I believe, because when we want to make those data driven decisions, we start understanding what the whole value stream looks like. But Greg's question is building upon the value streams for many is just the latest proxy for projects. Can you share your thoughts and experiences in introducing the concepts or entities of operational and development value streams so that it creates space for the entire business to see its participation in the value stream? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this because it's a little bit of, <laughs> it's a little bit of a hobby horse or a soapbox to me, actually. It was really lovely <laughs> last week. Um it was the fast flow conference in London. We had a mini floatopia on the Monday evening. Uh, in London and Steve Pereira was there and lots of our members were there and we had a beautiful evening and we did a great workshop with Steve and Craig and then the next day was the Fast Flow Conference. And it was so great to see Steve and he, um, Steve and his co-author uh, Andrew, his co-author Andrew was a monk and has this incredible like calmness about him. Steve actually has this very similar aura and I don't have, I don't think I have an aura of calmness, I have an aura of impatience. <laughs> and I kind of often think that things are wrong. And what Steve has taught me, one of the biggest lessons is to meet people where they are. So bear with me while I give you my philosophy of value stream classification. So I already said that I have an issue with people that classify some value streams as business and others as development, because to me, that is part of the same value stream, right? The business or product management is having the ideas and feeding those ideas to software delivery or software engineering. Uh, or development and it's coming uh, out to the customer. I have a problem with the development and operational value, uh, value stream classification as well. And I realized that I could be fighting a losing battle here because it's coming out of the very popular framework safe and it's very well known. Um, the very first time I saw it, I had quite a visceral reaction to it. And that is because you've got to remember that I've spent a lot of time working in DevOps. And what DevOps is all about is trying to make a connection between those two silos. So I'm kind of like allergic to anything that tries to separate development and operation. So I immediately looked and went, oh, no, no, we can't have that because they're part of the same thing. So I'm just going to finish with what my preferred classification of value streams is um, and also just try and say, but I understand that lots of people are using it um, and actually look at some of our materials for more on how we suggest it. But my preferred classification is actually core and supporting value streams, which I believe aligns quite nicely to team topologies uh, with the stream aligned team mm -hmm. being the core teams, which are delivering um, the value creating features for the direct customers um, and then the supporting teams are probably supporting the internal customers who are um, directly connected to the people that are actually paying the money for the services and products that will pay uh, everyone's salary. So I'm into the core and supporting um, value stream camp. That's me jumping off my soapbox now and saying, but I do understand that people are actively using those classifications uh, out there and it's working for some of them to greater and lesser extents. Your response though, Logan, um, how do you recommend that people expand their worldview beyond the silos that they've traditionally put into their organization? Um, I actually, surprisingly, uh, given, given, 
our our um, our status with scaled agile try to avoid um, the classification to begin with because I need and this is kind of based on my experience more than anything else um, trying to classify the value streams tries to kind of templatize or um, simplify something that's I'll use complected I think it's both complicated and complex. And I want people to start thinking of the bigger, the bigger picture, or at least the biggest picture that we have the right people in the room to, to, to paint and, um, um, not necessarily try to say, oh, this is, you know, this type of value stream and this type of value stream. And that probably fits more, more along the lines of what, what you're talking about with Steve and kind of meeting people where they are, um, and it, it seems to at least help us get the conversation started with the right questions being asked. If we still need to go through the exercise of trying to classify the value streams, I'm okay with it. But once we've, but only once we've had the the initial, hey, we need to think bigger than what you're thinking of from a classification perspective. Because I think, at least again in my experience, it try it kind of limits where we start uh, as opposed to thinking of big picture and then. A classification would be okay. I don't mind, you know, Helen, yours sound great, safe sound great. I think it really depends on what framework or who they've been speaking to before that helps them classify things um, that I'm willing to work with and, and kind of promote. Uh, so, yeah. I'm I think really ultimately, I'm just happy that people are talking value streams and trying to find them because <laughs> they, <laughs> they are there. Oh, we've got Both questions. Well, yeah. <laughs> Question from Walter, how do the companies that built themselves as a process-based organization make the switch to VSM? Can the two coexist or even support each other? This is a great question. So um, last week after the Fastflow conference, I flew out to Germany and spent some time with a telecoms company out there and with their project management chapter. Um, and what was really interesting is almost immediately before we'd even started doing the presentation, um, I was kind of like, well, how is this different to process management? So this whole conversation about what is a value stream, what is a process, what is value stream management, what is, what is process management is quite important. So I always say that value stream management is like a helicopter view. It's like an umbrella over all of these processes. So what we're looking at is how these processes connect to each other. How long does each one take? Um, and is there a lot of wait time between them? Are all the processes value creating as well? And this allows us... Mm -hmm. To look at that end and end cycle time and start to make experiments that say well do you know what there's a really long wait between um completing that development cycle and getting some input from security for example something i've seen in the real world or we've got three cabs none of them really add any value what can we do to remove the cabs out of this uh this this value stream or we might see, a, oh God, testing takes a really long time. So let's now, we've done our value stream map. Now let's do a process map on testing and understand why that's taken so long and what we can specifically do to optimize that process. While it may not be value creating, I always love this conversation about testing because it's not value creating, but it doesn't mean we'll ever get rid of it. We should never get rid right. of it. So it's essential. Right. Um, but it's it's a really healthy conversation to, to have to help people understand which other steps are value creating or not. Um, so how does that answer Walter's question? How do the companies uh, make the switch? Can the two coexist or even support each other? Um, yeah, I mean, Logan, what is a process-based organization? That's maybe where me stand first, yeah. Define it, yeah, I'm, um, well, thinking of where Walter may be coming from since I know him. Um, uh, I think you, I think you captured it well. It is an organization that kind of drives itself by following specific steps that are more about governance, um, maybe very tightly aligned to how projects should be managed again, governance. And, you know, you got to follow that governance process very rigidly versus our conversation here and trying to transform the governance-based conversation to the bigger picture of the value stream. Governance is always going to be part of what we do. You wrote about it in your book. Um, it is important. And I, I think 
that would be my definition. I think my answer to Walter's question is they, they have to coexist. Um, and that's because process-based organizations are probably process-based because they're highly regulated. And so we have to be able to adhere to not only um, kind of the governance of the organization, but there may be bigger governance required. Government, governance, legal governance, name your governance. <sighs> I, I think there's a, or the, the thought you just triggered in my head and what you were saying there was I was thinking about organisations that I've worked with that have felt very burdened by process as a result of governance, because what often mm -hmm. happens, and we talk about this in Investments Unlimited, is that there's a problem and the way that we fix it is to add more controls. So we end up with, with so much controls, it becomes what we often refer to as organisational scar tissue. So we got hurt and we put a control on and then... After, after a lot of time, that that all that scar tissue, we can call it different things like bureaucracy or red tape, but it's definitely all stuff that's getting in the way and slowing us down and is quite wasteful um, and not helping us perform to the best interests of our customers. So I think the answer to the question I'm trying to get to how do companies that have built themselves in that way make the switch is to actually use value stream management practices to uncover where that scar tissue is now really hurting them and holding them back and almost kind of reverse their position. So not delete and remove all of the process, but look at different ways of doing it. So it, it, referring back to the book Investments Unlimited again, a lot of the ways that we look at in that book are, are kind of DevOps automation ways. So we're looking at things like continuous compliance, so where we can automate um, governance into the system, basically. So where we can make sure that we've got the checks and balances um, that would cover having to sign three different forms and wait for four different sign-offs, um, basically getting around the red tape and not getting around the red tape and bureaucracy, because that sounds like we're trying to be chaotic and and um, remove, remove controls dangerously. Trying to be smarter and use the tech um, to streamline the process would be a much better way of describing it. Make the auditors happy. Um... Doesn't matter how you make them happy, make them happy. And you, you kind of flipping flipping the process based organization into an organization that can leverage value stream management. I think I would agree, Helen, with what you're saying. I, obviously, I agree with what your book says about it. Um, and you can, I think, you can leverage the practices mainly of focusing on um, prioritizing automation efforts to help out with with some of the work that needs to happen to flip from um, process-based, yeah. I've got a really good example actually of a value stream map I did with Lloyds Banking Group, which was with their retributions team. So the purpose of the retributions team is it's a highly governed team or is it, it's a team that has to exist because of high levels of governance. So their job is if you, Logan, find a loan from a bank and you get a certain rate and you found it on the website, Whereas I've been telephoned by the bank and I've received a loan and I've got a better rate than you, you have a right under the way that we're governed to make sure you get the same rate that I get because it has to be equal. So that particular team have to implement all of those governance. Um, they have to do retributions, they have to fix it when it's been wrong and they have to try and make sure the products have an equal playing field um, at the same time, even when they're being promoted across different things. So for me, that is an example of using a value stream, map, uh, value stream process management process um, to, sorry, that's an example of using a value stream management practice to have a really close look um, at a very process driven value stream, a process, um, a, a value stream born out of process and compliance and make improvements um, on it. Uh, and that would be one of those supporting value streams we talked about earlier, because that would support multiple products or multiple um, value streams that were core that were actually earning the money, like a loan value stream would be an example of a core value stream in that particular um, example. So we only have a few minutes left. Walter did want to follow that up, I think, though, with another comment. Process based organizations misses the focus on customer value. Yeah, but I don't believe they have to. I think. I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. I think they could learn to prioritise customer value. Do you think they could learn, Logan, or are they forever stuck in just process? No, I, I think they can learn. I, I think 
uh, again, maybe back to our leadership conversation, getting leadership to focus outside in and trying to understand that the we're in the age, sorry to say it, we're getting close to potentially getting close to the age change from software and digital to AI, right? You're in an age where a lot of distraction and potential disruption onto your current business model. And you, you really do have to try to get past the process based. Um, there's no way to get rid of the organizational scar tissue. Scar tissue is permanent. Um, but how do you kind of get more smart or more informed so that you can make great decisions to, to focus on customer value is, um, is I think where we want to drive. And that was a great question from Walter to get us thinking for sure. So sadly, we're going to have to wrap up today. I think, um, don't be sorry for saying we're moving into the age of AI. I think we're definitely like on in industry 5.0, whatever we like framework you want to call it. But I think we're there. I think what I'm hopeful of, and I think Stephen Walters kind of said this to me the other day, in that we just want to get past the point where all we seem to talk about is AI and it just becomes mm -hmm. a given and we get back to the things that are actually going to give us more improvement, things like VSM. So I don't think we're far from that. Um, it's been great today. If you wanted to leave the audience with the thing that they could do next to get going on VSM and how you could help, what would you ask them to do? Obviously, um, I'm always happy to answer questions. We have a couple of great experts that are tied to VSMC that are happy to answer questions too. And we kind of field those to the right person based on the content of the question. Um, we've talked about books read Helen's book, read Steve's book. I think that those are great examples of what's possible and from a value stream management perspective and maybe even how to get started, right? If you're really trying to ask yourself, where do I get started? I wanna learn more or I wanna actually implement this. Those books are super helpful. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you audience for being with us today. Um, see you next time or see you somewhere sometime soon. Thanks Logan. Thanks, Alan. Take care. Bye, Bye everybody.